Good morning, everyone. Thank you for thank you all for joining us virtually at Eugene Reimer here today. Our goal today is to have a student led Remembrance Day assembly that pays tribute to our veterans and helps us give thanks. Our assembly today is a formal gathering, the most formal gathering we have as a student body. I ask that you respect with your silence and attention this Remembrance Day service. This is not an opportunity for applause, but rather an opportunity for quiet reflection. East Whale, we acknowledge that the Abbotsford School District is located on the traditional territory of the Stolo people, the Seamath and Mathsqui First Nation. With this, we respect the long-standing relationship that the Indigenous nations have to this land as they're the original caretakers. At this time, I'd like you to please rise for the singing of our national anthem. I would like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us at our formal Remembrance Day Assembly. Thank you parents and community members, as well as Eugene Reimer staff and students for your respectful attendance, especially in this virtual format. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, Canadians are asked to pause in memory of the thousands of men and women who volunteered, served, and in many cases, sacrificed their lives in military service for our country. This is our opportunity today to remember as we mark Canada's 154th anniversary as a country, we remember with honor those from wars past who served with courage and conviction. We pay special attention to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice, giving their lives in service of our country. And we also salute the service men of, and women of today who risk life and limb to fight injustice of, in pursuit of a better world. On November 11th, we remember and acknowledge our responsibility to work for the peace they fought so hard to achieve, lest we forget. November 8th is a special day, and as it marks Indigenous Veterans Day in Canada, Indigenous veterans have reasons to be proud of their wartime contributions. More than 7,000 First Nations members served in the First and Second Wars and the Korean War. And an unknown number of Inuit Métis and other Indigenous people also participate. One veterans group estimates that 12,000 Indigenous people served in the three wars. On each occasion, Indigenous members of the armed forces overcame culture challenges and made impressive sacrifices and contributions to help the nation in its efforts to restore world peace. It was an incredible re response, consistent with a remarkable tradition. The grade eights reflected on Indigenous veterans' sacrifices. This is the National Aboriginal Veterans Monument. To Aboriginal war veterans in Canada and those that have fallen, this monument is raised in sacred and everlasting 
honor of contributions of all Aboriginal Canadians in war and peacekeeping operations. The monument was unveiled on June 21st, 2001, National Aboriginal Day in Ottawa. An eagle occupies the highest point of the sculpture. It symbolized the creator and embodies the spirit of Canadian Aboriginal people. The monument is for Aboriginal veterans in Canada, First Nations, Midi, and Inuit people. The wolf as a spirit guide to family values. The elk represents stamina and never giving up. The bear signifies tremendous strength and healing power. The buffalo is for its connection to the earth. Indigenous people served in armed forces and came home to seek change for their people. Indigenous veterans in World War II who served in Canadian armed forces with distinction returned to Canada seeking social and political changes. It wasn't until 1960 that First Nation people were allowed to vote in Canada. Edith Anderson was born in 1890 on the Six Nations Grant River Reserve. The youngest of eight children, she wanted to be a nurse as a young woman, but there were few possibilities to train in Canada. As a result, she attended the New Rochelle School of Nursing in New York City and worked as a registered nurse at the American Elementary School after graduating in 1914. Anderson, 27, and 19 other nurses, 14 of whom were also Canadians, enlisted in the United States Medical Corps in 1917. They were in the individual segment France at Buffalo Base Hospital 23, a former vacation hotel Within months, the majority of Mrs. Anderson's time was spent in the hospital treating soldiers who had been shot or gassed. She was occasionally dispatched to assist at other medical faculties, providing her with the opportunity to travel around the country. She, see a, she saw a lot more than she wanted to. She passed away only a week shy of her 106th birthday. Can you believe that? She died when she was 106 and lived a long life of fearlessness and success, and is still a role model to many. Charles Checkers Tompkins was a Métis man who was born January 8, 1918 in the village of Girard in northern Alberta. Before the war, Charles was taught how to speak Cree by both his grandparents and parents. He joined the Canadian Army to serve in the Second World War. He was assigned to the 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade stationed in London. There, the Canadian High Command issued a secret meeting where they divided the soldiers into groups based on the indigenous languages they spoke. That's when Charles was tested on accuracy and told that he would serve as a Cree code talker. These languages helped top secret allied military communications by hiding information about troops and supplies from enemies. Charles translated the messages into Cree and they were sent to battlefields in Europe where another code talker would translate the message into English to inform the commanders. Charles struggled to find work when he returned to Canada after the war. So he re-enlisted in the Canadian Army. He served in the armed forces for another 25 years in different regiments, and he later became a corporal. Despite the racial discrimination they faced, First Nation soldiers still took up arms in the Second World War. Their reasons for doing so were related to employment opportunities or feelings of patriotism. Some felt that enlistment would enhance their claims towards full citizenship and legal equity in Canada after the war.
Success fought bravely in both world wars and in the Second World War, played an important role for the liberation of Europe. There's a Saint Soldier tradition that draws Sikhs to the military to fight for peace through justice. More than 83,000 Sikhs died and over 135,000 were injured in World War II and World, and World War I. Now we'll watch a video that shows footage and images of Sikh soldiers that served in the war while wearing their turbans and acknowledgement they have received for their brave efforts. Hundreds of members of Canada's Sikh community gathered at Kitchener's Mount Hope Cemetery to honour the memory of Private Buckham Singh. Today marks the ninth annual Sikh Remembrance Day ceremony. It's the largest annual gathering of Sikh soldiers and veterans in North America. Private Singh's grave site is the only military grave in the country for a Sikh soldier who fought in either of the world wars. This ceremony is designated to allow all Canadians the opportunity to appreciate our inclusive nature. To stand out and to stand proud and to fully participate is an honor uh, and it's you know an incredible importance to continue uh, and, and something that I'm proud to you know be a part of. Only uh, nine six were allowed to join the uh, Canadian forces. Thousands tried at the time, but they were turned away. And I think if uh, he was alive today, he would be amazed to see the uh, the transformation in society and how inclusive we've become as a nation. Private Singh fought in the Battle of Flanders in 1916. He was wounded twice during the war. He died in a military hospital in Kitchener in 1919 at just 25 years old. It's drill night for these reservists. Time to look sharp for their commanding officer. He is Harjit Singh Sajjan, Lieutenant Colonel of the BC Regiment. That is easy. That is easy. Uh, welcome back. No different than any other officer, he likes to say. Combat breaks down barriers, we know that. Because no one looks at how, what you look like when the bullets start flying. 
troop leader can actually... Speak. But no question, the story of Canada's first Sikh commanding officer is pretty unique. Six years old when his parents left India to start from scratch in Canada, Kundan laboring in mills, Vidya picking berries, struggling to raise good Canadian kids. I used to take them with me, she says, so they could play close while I picked berries. In my mind, I was always hoping they would go to school and become something. Their boy would grow up to become a Vancouver cop and join the Army Reserves. That made Vidya an anxious mom. But Kondan was all for it until his son's basic training, when Harjit was told he should cut his hair a violation of his religion. Naturally, it happens, he says, when you're the only Sikh person there. He had a hard time, but I told him, you must trust your faith. Harjit persevered. He wouldn't cut his hair or trim his beard. Now, though, he refuses to dwell on the barriers or slurs he faced. These days, he says, diversity equals military intelligence. It's not political correctness. For the Canadian forces, it's an operational necessity, and we've proven that overseas. Indeed, in Bosnia, and two tours of duty in Afghanistan, Sajan proved himself on the battlefield. As a special advisor to a Canadian commander, then an American general. The running joke was, no, I can't, there's no way, how, how could I be the special advisor looking like this, right? His Sikh background and police training were invaluable, connecting with local Afghans, helping gain intelligence about insurgents. Immediately, because of the warrior culture, you get respect. And wearing a uniform, again, you can get greater respect. So you don't have to go through this uh, rapport building process. Sajjan's bravery saved hundreds of lives, according to a general. His hard work won him promotion according to his dad. If you work with determination, he says, then you get recognition and your parents and the community and the country will be happy. When the community gathered last week to remember World War I veteran Private Buckham Singh, the only Sikh Canadian with a military grave in Canada, Sajjan was an honored guest. When Canada was at war, he volunteered, and it's because of him that I am a commanding officer today. Perhaps the older ones who look at the Lieutenant Colonel recognize the irony that he commands the very regiment which, notoriously, in 1914, forced the Kamagata Maru to sail back to India, barring hundreds of Sikhs from entering Canada. Sajjan symbolizes a victory then, but on Remembrance Day, he thinks of losses, the soldiers who died beside him in Afghanistan. Having to carry uh, your uh, you know, wounded uh, soldiers off the battlefield, not just wounded, but uh, the ones that have been killed and placed them on a helicopter, nothing prepares you for that. It's done. That's it. Now his only goal, to train his soldiers, one of Canada's most diverse regiments. We are uh, all Canadians and uh, you know, we have uh, every right to serve our country and uh, die for our country as well. A sacrifice more willingly made for a country that recognizes cultural strengths can translate into military might. Duncan McHugh, CBC News, Vancouver. Many men and women in our Local communities have served. Here are a few Canadian soldiers sharing what Remembrance Day means to them. Hi, I'm Trooper Abbott Rebel. Remembrance Day means to me remembering those who served their country to allow us to have the freedom we have now in Canada. My name is Corporal Clark. Um, remembrance Day means to me thinking about and remembering uh, the fallen and thinking about uh, the people who used to wear the uniform before us and also connecting and reaching out to friends old and new. I'm Corporal Alexander. What Remembrance Day means to me is an acknowledgement of what we have and also of what we've lost. Every year we get reminded of some things that are missing in our lives and what we've lost over the years and wars or conflicts past. But I also like to think about what we've gained as a result 
of democracy and the rights and freedoms that we celebrate. That is my reminder I get every year when I remember on Remembrance Day. Hello, my name is Corporal Ka. Uh, Remembrance Day means to me honoring those that came before us, um, to have the privileges that we have today to live in the Canada that we know today. So we are here to honor them. I'm as Corporal Vlasta, and uh, Remembrance Day means to me take memories about our um, present and past uh, fallen uh, comrades, and especially uh, my, uh, my grandmother that was uh, a World War II veteran. She was a uh, combat uh, nurse that passed away uh, recently last year. Hi, my name is Nash Corporal Lim. Uh, Remembrance Day is important to me because it reminds us of all the soldiers that have been through those gates, and it also it's a time for me to remember my friend who just passed away recently. Remembrance Day is a time where I can remember about my friends and family that have passed and that have gone in the footsteps before me. And yeah, that's why I remember. This year marks the 76th anniversary of the end of World War II. After almost six long years of fighting, the Second World War finally came to an end on August 15, 1945, when Japanese forces surrendered in Asia and the Pacific. Victory over Japan Day was declared and large crowds gathered in Canada and around the world to celebrate the coming of peace and remember the tremendous sacrifices that had been made. While the bulk of Canada's military efforts in the Second World War were focused in Europe, our country also committed forces to the struggle against Japan and Asia and the Pacific. In fact, more than 10,000 Canadians served in that theater of war. Canadian service members were involved in the struggle against Japan during the Second World War from the beginning. The fighting in Asia and the Pacific was not started only by the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941. Japanese forces also struck other British and American targets in the region, like the British colony of Hong Kong, where 1,975 Canadians had arrived only a few weeks earlier. The war started in Hong Kong on the 7th, see, and from the 7th to the 25th we were fighting. It was very difficult to hold any position with our limited manpower, but the Canadians fought uh, without any uh, hesitation. They put on 40,000 men against our six. and they had another 40,000 waiting on the other side. These brave soldiers were mostly members of the Royal Rifles of Canada and the Winnipeg Grenadiers. Greatly outnumbered, the Allied forces in Hong Kong held out in the face of fierce enemy assaults for two and a half weeks before they were finally forced to surrender. We were taken prisoner on December 25th, 1941, Christmas Day. In all, 290 Canadians died in the fighting and the remainder were captured. The survivors would spend the rest of the war, more than three and a half years, in harsh Japanese prisoner of war camps, where 264 more of them would lose their lives as a result of the backbreaking labor, beatings, disease, and starvation they endured. The Royal Canadian Air Force also played a role in the war against the Japanese from the start. Many of our airmen would be assigned to Royal Air Force units that were sent all over the world, including Asia. Thousands of RCAF members would serve in the region, most of them as part of the Burma campaign. They would fill a wide variety of roles, from being radar operators to flying with RAF or RCAF, bomber, transport, reconnaissance, and fighter squadrons. The Royal Canadian Navy would also play a supporting role in the struggle against Japan when HMCS Uganda joined the British Pacific Fleet in time to participate in the Allied operations around Okinawa in the spring of 1945. HMCS Prince Robert, which had helped transport Canadian troops to Hong Kong in 1941, also had the satisfaction of returning there after the Japanese surrender to help the newly liberated Canadian prisoners of war.
Canadian Merchant Navy sailors also served throughout this part of the world on Canadian and Allied transport vessels, helping carry the troops and cargoes essential to the eventual Allied victory in the Pacific. The dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki would force the Japanese to finally surrender and the 15th of August 1945 would be declared victory over Japan, VJ Day. After almost six years of bitter fighting, the Second World War was over at last, kicking off both massive celebrations and grief for the many lives that had been lost. More than 10,000 Canadians served in Asia and the Pacific during the conflict, and we remember their great courage and sacrifice. So the story is about the Canadian spirit. 3,000 miles from home, with no hope, they never gave up. The remembrance of World War II and notable events such as Battle of the Pacific are important aspects of our country's freedom. So we must remember those who fought courageously to protect our rights. The battles that we fought during World War II, such as the Battle of the Pacific, that helped shape Canada to what we know today as a country. Remembering those historical events makes me grateful for the country I live in today. The peace and the freedom we now enjoy today would not have been possible without the efforts of the brave Canadians who served in the Second World War. 75 years later, we pay tribute to the contributions and the sacrifices they made to help the Allies to victory in the largest conflict the world has ever seen. We will remember them. A message from the Government of Canada. According to the Royal Canadian Legion, the poppy has stood as a visual symbol for our Canadian remembrance since 1921. However, its presence over the graves of soldiers and the fields of honour was noted as early as the 19th century after the Napoleonic Wars. The reason for its adoption over 100 years later in Canada was due to the Lieutenant Colonel John McCrae and his now famous poem in Flanders Fields. At one time, lapel poppies were made by veterans with disabilities in workshops in Montreal and Toronto and served as a small source of income for their veterans and families. Today, though made in factories, poppy production continues under strict legion control. Today, we encourage all Canadians to proudly wear a poppy. By doing so, our veterans will see that their efforts and sacrifices are not in vain. In other words, they will know that we will remember them. Now today, we'll recite In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow. Between the crosses, row on row, the mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing. Flies, grace, a herd, amend the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our coil with the foe. To you from falling hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Student representatives from each pod are invited to pay their respects by placing wreaths at the cross to symbolize our thanks to our fellow Canadians who gave their lives for our country. After the song, there will be one minute of silence. 
please bow your heads in respectful contemplation for our soldiers. Please stand and bow your heads in silence.
We wear the poppy for men and women who survived wars, as well as for men and women who served in our Canadian Armed Forces and fought to protect and promote those rights and freedoms we hold dear as Canadians. This November 11th, please consider how you will remember. Please consider virtually attending a Remembrance Day ceremony online or paying your respects in a physically distanced, safe environment. 